What's going on guys? The Comics Kid 2099 here. Welcome to day 39 of the 365 day graphic novel review challenge. Today I want to talk to you about another one of the Secret Wars tie-ins from 2015. This is the five issue miniseries called Years of Future Past based on the Days of Future Past storyline from I believe 1980. Uh, this is written by Margaret Bennett with art by Mike Norton. And Oh boy, this is just a really depressing comic book. And I know what you're going to say. You're going to say the original Days of Future Past storyline was pretty depressing as well. And it was, but only in the segments that took place in the future. Which, by the end of that story, was a possible future that was averted by the X-Men. Or was it? In this possible future, all of the X-Men die. All hope seems to be lost. But then in the present day, Senator Kelly is not killed. The X-Men save him. And so maybe that future is not going to happen. So there's a glimmer of hope. Or is there? Because then Sebastian Shaw tries to convince Senator Kelly to fund the building of Sentinels which in theory is going to lead to a world very similar to the Days of Future Past world that we saw in that storyline. So uh, depending on if you're a glass half full or glass half empty kind of guy, the original story was either really depressing or there is a glimmer of hope and that story is not going to come to be in the future of the Marvel 616 timeline. Uh, this story is entirely set in that awful future, uh, which is good because since this is a segment of Battleworld, which is a big planet that is made up of different alternate realities that have all been uh, smushed together, it would have been really confusing to try and throw time travel into the mix also. So I'm glad that they stuck with the elements of the possible future from the original Days of Future Past storyline, but that world, like I said, is a really dark and depressing place. And they did not disappoint. If you are looking for dark and depressing, then this is definitely something that you're going to want to check out. Me, I did not enjoy this because it was so incredibly dark and depressing. Uh, so basically the premise of this is it's very similar to the original Days of Future Past storyline, but in this particular story, Senator Kelly is the president, and he has made the Days of Future Past future that we saw in the original story happen. Uh, so he has authorized uh, internment camps for all of the mutants, and uh, Wolverine, he's out on the streets, uh, kind of like he was in the original Days of Future Past story, and uh, Kitty Pride, Colossus, Magneto, and Rachel, they are all in the camps, kind of like they were in the original story, but in this story, uh, Kitty Pride and Colossus, they have a daughter named Chrissy or Christina, and then Wolverine has a son named Cameron. Uh, or does he? Spoilers. Uh, I've maybe already spoiled something anyway, but uh, I'm going to keep going. Uh, so it turns out that Cameron is actually Kitty and Colossus's son, and for some reason, they decided to split their kids up. It's not entirely made clear why they did that. Uh, Kitty just says that uh, they were under attack, and then they decided to let Wolverine take their son, and then later, they gave birth to Christina while they were inside the camps. Uh, and then, right after that, uh, mutants started being sterilized so that they couldn't have any more kids. Uh, so, the people inside the camps, Magneto, uh, Rachel, Kitty, and Colossus, they were basically grooming Christina to be the ultimate mutant messiah who is going to lead the world into a brighter, better tomorrow. Meanwhile, Wolverine is an awful parent, and he is teaching Cameron how awful the world is and how you just got to do whatever you got to do to survive. So, in the present day, uh, you've got the X-Men, or what's left of them, they want... Uh, Christina to save Robert Kelly, the president, from a mutant attack or a sentinel attack uh, because at different points in the story uh, it changes. Uh, sometimes they're saying it's going to be a sentinel attack and then at one point they're acting like mutants are going to attack him. Uh, but they want Christina, who is the beacon of hope for mutant kind, to save Robert Kelly and then everyone will be happy. Uh, mutants will be like, oh, okay, uh, we can all live in peace with the humans. And then humans will be like, oh, okay, we can all live in peace with the mutants. That is their plan. Uh, but then you find out that there is a secret plan that Rachel and Magneto cooked up where they are secret secretly going to try and kill Christina and then they are going to turn her into a martyr for mutant kind. And nobody else knew this. And then after this plan is uncovered, Cameron suddenly becomes a maniacal supervillain and he says that he is going to go and kill Robert Kelly because uh, he firmly believes that mutants and humans cannot coexist and he wants mutants to be eradicated. And he thinks that if he goes and kills Robert Kelly, that all of the mutants will be killed. And 
Maybe this is just the genocidal maniac inside me speaking, but uh, Cameron kind of sort of has a point to a degree. Uh, he talks about how the world was fine until superhumans came along, and then suddenly uh, it just all fell apart, and he blames all the problems of this particular world on mutants and, I guess, to a degree, superhumans like the Fantastic Four, Spider-Man, and the Avengers. Uh, he says that everything was fine before superhumans showed up. Now, I'm going to go ahead and call both focus on that because there's still a whole lot of really awful stuff that exists in our real world today that existed before superhumans would have shown up in the Marvel Universe. Uh, things like slavery, war, genocide, stuff like that. Those are not mutant inventions, but you can kind of sort of see Cameron's point of view because a lot of the really awful stuff that happens in the Marvel Universe is because of superhumans. Whether they are superheroes or supervillains, a lot of awful stuff happens because of the existence of these superhumans. So you can kind of sort of see Cameron's point of view, but he devolves into this caricature. Uh, at one point, he's arguing with his sister, his uh, I guess his full sister. At first, I was going to say half-sister. He's arguing with her, saying this is what they have to do. And you kind of feel like there's a Charles Xavier Magneto thing going on where both of these people feel like they are right, but they're both doing very different things. But then when he goes to kill Robert Kelly, suddenly he just becomes a crazy supervillain, very one-dimensional, very mustache twirly, uh, almost like a psychopath who just loves killing people. Uh, that's kind of what he devolves into. He's smiling really big when he's trying to kill Robert Kelly, and he just uh, doesn't become the interesting character that this book wants you to think that he is in the first chunk of the book. Uh, but anyway, uh, the day is sort of saved, but it's a very hollow victory. Uh, the book does not have a happy ending, uh, even though uh, at the end of the day, Robert Kelly does not want uh, the surviving mutants to be uh, captured or contained. Uh, so seemingly, uh, it's a victory for the mutants, but like I said, it's a hollow victory because of Cameron deciding to become a supervillain, uh, which, I don't know, maybe if this had been a longer series and we could have gotten to know Cameron and Christina a little bit better, maybe this would have felt more gut-wrenching and it would have felt more believable getting to see this guy and getting to know him and then when he finally says, I'm going to kill Senator Kelly, or sorry, President Kelly, then it would be like, oh, okay, yeah, I can kind of see him doing that. As is, as soon as we see this guy, he is immediately butting heads with Christina on philosophical stuff, uh, which, by the way, Christina, a lot like her mother, is a huge hypocrite. Uh, at one point, uh, her brother kills somebody, and she's like, how dare you do that? How dare you kill someone? Then later, Kitty Pride kills somebody, and Christina doesn't seem to have a problem with it. And then later still, spoilers, Christina kills somebody, and she's gut-wrenching, and she's all sad and tragic and everything. Uh, but it's just really hypocritical when her brother kills somebody, and she calls him out on it, and then her mom does it and she doesn't seem to care but whatever um i didn't really enjoy this story it's not that it's a bad story although i'm not going to say that it's a great story either uh, i do think that you need to be a little bit familiar with the days of future past storyline to read this maybe not uh maybe i'm just bringing my knowledge of the days of future past storyline into this book uh maybe you don't need to know it all you really need to know is it's a post-apocalyptic future where mutants are kept in internment camps and they bring all that information into the story uh, so i'll redact that statement uh but uh, I did not enjoy this. That's not to say that it's a bad story, but it's definitely not one that I would recommend that you read just because it's so depressing and I don't like to be sad when I read stories. I like to be enjoying the stuff that I read or watch or whatever. I don't want to be sad and just leaving the story with a really bitter taste in my mouth. I don't like that feeling. Uh, so uh, I am not going to recommend Years of Future Past, but not because of the quality of the story, mostly because it's just so dark and bleak. Uh, so those are my thoughts on this story. I hope that you guys liked this video. And if you did, be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe. And I will be back tomorrow with another video. In the meantime, you guys have a great rest of the day. Catch you later.